it's a training slide set which was developed uh, together with TDR and FINE and WHO and um, is, a, is a quite a, a good a tool and you have a lot of speaker notes that you can use as well. So it, it goes into the mechanism of um, red um, RDTs. We are targeting some proteins, so antigens which are produced by the parasite. There are three types of target antigens. One is the histidine rich protein. One is the plasmodium lactate dehydrogenase, which has uh, different targets and we will look into this. And then aldolase, which is uh, common to all uh, malaria species. Now, histidine rich protein two is not a vital protein for the uh, falciparum. It's only present in this parasite, and even if it's missing, the parasite survives very well, both in vivo and in vitro. So it's something to remember. Parasite uh, life cycle, this is when uh, the parasite enters the body, the sporozoites reach very quickly the liver, and then you have the blood stages, which go for the majority and the large duration of the parasite cycle. And uh, the HRP2 and the PLDH and aldolase, they are all produced uh, by the trophozoites. They are um, available on the red blood cell membrane. They are available in the cytoplasm inside, but also they are uh, put in the bloodstream. When uh, we look at the what is available on the gametocytes, uh, the young gametocytes, they have HRP2 antigens, and the mature gametocytes, they have a PLDH and aldolase. So it's something to remember that gametocytes as well may express uh, these antigens. Now, the, the body that we have is producing specific antibodies against these antigens and of course many other antigens of the parasites. And there are some RDTs which are antibody detection uh, tests. But the, the RDTs that we use for malaria and we found and they're both in large number for the public sector, they are antigen detecting RDTs. They have monoclonal on the RDTs which are targeting these uh, malaria antigens. And uh, another thing is interesting, and these are not uh, chemical uh, tests, these are biological tests. So they depend on an antigen antibody reaction, which are protein reactions. And this is very important for the stability of this test, and also the way we need to keep them uh, under certain temperature control in a very well um, uh, sealed packaging and aluminum. So these are all uh, uh, important elements uh, to preserve uh, the key elements which are inside the RDTs. We will look into this. Now, if somebody has the malaria parasite, also he will have the antigens which are produced by the parasites and the test will be positive. But, uh, and if there are no parasites and recently there may be no detectable antigen, the RDT will be negative and there is some difference. Um, let me, let, we will go into this maybe a little later. We looked already last time with a little video on how the, uh, the tests are made. There is a buffer where you put the, the blood, which is normally labeled with an A, and then B, where you put the buffer solution, which is labeled as a B. And then when the reaction moves, the results are displayed in this test window. This is very common in most of the RDTs we have. And this is a real photo. When uh, the results appear in the test window, they are uh, shown with uh, some lines uh, which are colored. Uh, the color is because uh, there is some colloidal gold which is linked uh, to the monoclonals. So it's uh, the assembly of many, many monoclonals at a specific uh, section of the strip which makes this line then visible. 
Now, if we don't have any test result in the test window, but only the control line is shown, this is a negative test. And the control line is only to tell us that the test has been running quite well and the antigen antibody complex have reached the control section of the test window. And if we don't see the control line, it means the test is invalid, we need to repeat. But if we see the, the control line, it doesn't mean that the test is good. So the use of the control line, this is important, is only to reject the test if we cannot see it. It cannot tell us if the test has been running properly or not. So this is quite an interesting concept and uh, sometimes, very often, uh, many colleagues get this uh, not with the right interpretation. So this is a photo to show you many different types, uh, different shapes, different forms, uh, and all of them, they have a well where we put the blood and a different well where we put uh, the buffer. Some test, uh, they actually have a single well where you're going to put both, but the majority, if you see most of the others, they have the two separate. Now, if we were able to go inside and see the different elements, uh, there is one part of the strip, uh, this is where we have this well A, where uh, on the strip itself, um, we find a set of uh, antibodies, monoclonals, which have uh, uh, some uh, dye labeling, which is colloidal gold, on one of the extremes of the monoclonal. And they are uh, free. They are not, in this, form, in this point, uh, linked uh, to the strip. There is also normally an agent which is already on the strip, which helps to do the hemolysis as soon as we put the blood on the strip. And then if we go down the strip and we look into the test window, we will not see them, they are invisible, but there are some monoclonals which are here to uh, capture the complex antigen antibody when it's positive. And also we have some other monoclonals which are on the control line, which are to capture the antibodies when they move down the strip. So let us see again how this works. If there is a, a positive antigen and the monoclonal is specific against this, there will be this antigen antibody reaction. And um, we know that the first step is when the blood is put in the well A, and if there are antigens, this is the reaction that will occur inside the well A. And then second step, one adds the buffer solution, which is to promote the flushing, the movement of the blood across the strip, but also it also um, improves the hemolysis uh, and so the release of the uh, antigens which are inside the red blood cells. It also includes a lot of other substances which uh, can neutralize uh, if there are uh, uh, agents which do some cross reaction with the malaria antigens like uh, rheumatoid factors. So it's very important to have the buffer solution and that it should be specific for the type of additives which is being uh, used. So if uh, there is a, a positive antigen, the monoclonal will, will be on the well A, makes this uh, antigen antibody reaction. And then when we add the buffer solution, this moves down the strip and then is captured by the test at the test line by some specific antibodies. And then some other antibodies which are also running down the strip that will be captured by the control line. And this, as you see, are antibodies not specific for the protein, but they are simply detecting the antibodies which are present on the strip.
So again, if we could dissect the strip, this is nitrocellulose. This is uh, some um, uh, pad uh, which is used to absorb uh, uh, the sample. And again, also this, this helps the movement by capillarity across the nitrocellulose strip. And this is being promoted also by another absorption pad, other material, which in a way attracts the water content along the strip. On the plastic, there are also some holes, normally at this stage, to promote evaporation, which also facilitate the movement. Now, these antigens are um, different. The HRP2 antigen is only present in falciparum. And uh, what you, we all know, and I'm sure you know, it can persist for several weeks um, after the parasite has been completely removed from the blood. So it gives what we call a persistent positivity. This is typical of HRP2 detecting RDTs. Then when we look at uh, PLDH, the parasite lactate dehydrogenase, this can be specific for falciparum, specific for vivax, specific for the non-falciparum vivax ovale or malarian, or it could be a pan-PLDH. It means that it's positive for all species. Now the parasite lactage dehydrogenase is a vital enzyme for the parasite and it disappears very quickly after the parasite death. So if somebody has been cured and we do a PLDH detecting RDTs, the test will be negative. However, just remember it can also be present on the mature gametocyte. So if somebody is treated we can eliminate all the asexual forms, but if there are some gametocytes which are still circulating, the test may also still remain positive. And then less and less, uh, we found that these other uh, antigens which are detecting aldolase, they are not very popular, very few programs buy them. They are only, um, pan specific, it means that they cannot differentiate any species. Like uh, the PLDH, they are not detectable after the parasite death, and they also are present on both asexual and asexual forms. Now, these different antigens can be present in multiple combinations. And uh, just to repeat, HRP2 is only present in falciparum. But uh, PLDH, there is a specific PFPLDH for falciparum. If uh, the, the, the antigen, if there is on the RDT a pan PLDH, this also will be positive in case of falciparum. Now, for Vivax, uh, there is a P PLDH Vivax specific antigen. But if there is a pan-PLDH or an aldolase, this also will result positive. So the, the aldolase also for falciparum. But if we have a PVOM PLDH, which is positive for Vivax or Valer malaria, also this may be positive. If for detecting malaria, we don't have a PM specific PLDH, but we can use a pan PLDH, an aldolase, or somebody which can tell us simply is non falciparum, is something else, but it will be positive in case there is malaria. And similar for plasmodium ovale. We don't have on the market any commercial um, test available which can. Um, differentiate specifically plasmodium malaria or plasmodium ovale. So this is the type of uh, test available on the market and there are even more. And uh, interesting, uh, the exercise we did last time was using an um, PF pan antigen, which could have been this one, or it could have been uh, an um, HRP2 uh, 
pan PLDH antigen. So one of these two was the one that we used as the, as the test last time. In terms of price, the PF only are very cheap now, 20, 25 cents for each test, but the combination tests are a little more expensive. And when we see the results, uh, clearly if we have an HRP2 detecting test, this is very straightforward. The test can be negative, positive for falciparum or invalid. But remember when we were looking the PF PAN test that we use for our test, it is a little more complex. It could be negative, it could be invalid, it can tell us it's a non falciparum malaria, but it also can tell us it is falciparum or mixed. And then there are some RDTs, even more complex, uh, which can give us like six different results. Uh, and uh, these are also available on the market. So it's important that the program selects uh, the best uh, test, uh, but also easy to use and to interpret. This is just to remember the falciparum only test, relatively easy, positive, there is a positive test line, even if this is very, very, very thin. And if we don't see the C line, the control line, the test is invalid, it needs to be repeated, very simple, nothing else. If the control line is there and there is no test line, the results are negative. Uh, doctor, we had a question from Dr. Misak. If the yes. control line uh, in the chat box, if the control line is still appearing even after the RDT expired, uh, is it valid? Yeah, the problem is we should not use expired RDTs because uh, uh, we do not know if all the elements that the manufacturer established for being uh, functioning uh, are still fully in operation by the time the test has expired. So, as I said, we should not use the C line, the control line, to test, the, to say that the, the test has been running well. We can only use the control line like this. If we don't see it, the test is invalid, we need to do another test. So it's only to tell us that, that, that when we don't see it, there is something major wrong and the test needs to be repeated. So the answer is no, to be very simple. The, there is also a raised hand by uh, Dr. Mustafa Osman. Yeah, thank you. I cannot see in my presentation way the, the other yes. presenting, yes. So what is the question? No, it, it's just a raised hand. I don't know if it's uh, by mistake or... Uh, it Dr. Was Mustafa? In the beginning, Sorry. it was an old one. Ah, okay. From the okay, sorry. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. And then when we look at uh, the combo test, the PF PAN, this is what we looked at last time. Uh, we can have a negative result, only control line is visible, no test line, or we can have an invalid result if uh, there is no visible control line. Now the test needs to be repeated. For positive results, we can have a falciparum line present, even if it is very, very, very thin, this is a falciparum result. Or if we see another line for the pan line, it means that this is a non-falciparum result, could be Vivax, ovale, or malaria, or a combination of the one of the three. Or if we see both, it could be falciparum, mono-infection, or a mixed infection, because the PAN line may be activated by the falciparum as well. Now, because of the PAN line has not the same sensitivity as the HRP2 line, this is why the falciparum can give us, for in some infections, uh, only one line or even a mono infection of falciparum can give us the two lines, the pan line. For instance, suppose that the falciparum infection has a low HRP2 antigen 
and low PF PLDH antigen or the PAN PLDH antigen. The HRP2 monoclonal are very sensible, so they will give us a, a very clear line, but the PAN PLDH line will not be able to detect a low level of this anti antigen. If the level of antigen is very high, we may see, even if it is a mono infection of falciparum, we can see both lines, both the falciparum, sorry, the HRP2 line, as well as the PAN-PLDH line. So the control line, again to repeat, uh, we cannot use it to say that the test is valid. We can only use it to say this test is bad, we cannot see the line, it needs to be repeated. And this is just to tell you why this is the case, okay? Suppose that there is a, a major problem with the temperature or manufacturing, and uh, for instance, the, there is some problem with the antigen-antibody reaction. So for some reason, the, um, this monoclonal is no longer able to detect the parasite antigen. When we run the, this test along the nitrocellulose, the, the, even a defective monoclonal, which is not able to detect the parasite antigen, can be detected by the C line, by the control line. And so, it doesn't tell us anything about the integrity of the antigen-antibody reaction. Also, the fact that, that uh, the monoclonals normally have to be uh, binding to the test line, if there are some defect of manufacturing and this not work, this can be all possible. The test doesn't show any result on the test line but the control line may be working. So just to give you a reason, some possible explanation why a control line can be visible, but the test still doesn't work. Either the monoclonal don't recognize the antigen or the capture monoclonal on the test line are not bound to the line where they should be uh, working. And because the temperature produces a denaturation of the proteins, when the temperature is high, all of these specific antibodies um, and points of uh, the detection of between antibody and uh, antigen can be distorted by, and so we lose the, the basically immunological reaction. So temperature is one of the key determinants of the functionality of the RDTs. Now, there are many other factors uh, beyond the temperature which can affect the sensitivity of the RDT. For instance, the buffer volume. If the user has not added sufficient amount, the red blood cell may be not uh, going into hemolysis, and so also the flow along the strip may be compromised. Also, if uh, there is not enough blood volume, if the, when we use the micro pipette or the inverted cup, the amount is not sufficient, there may be not enough antigens in the test to be detected. Or even if it is too much, if it is the amount has been excessive, there could be completely a red uh, test um, window so we don't see very well the lines in case of positivity. If the test is read too quickly, this does not allow too much time to read the results. And so the test may be positive, maybe at 15, 20 minutes at the time of reading. If you read it at five minutes, it may not be still positive at that time. So it's very important even if the test is left on the bench and is read maybe after one hour, there could be what we call backflow. Some of the movement of the fluid goes back into the test window. And when it stops, it creates like a, a line. And this may look like a very faint positive line. 
So even reading beyond the text, the time specified by the manufacturer can give us wrong reading. And this would be a false positive, not a problem of sensitivity, but of specificity. We have, we have another question in the chat box. Yes. The, uh, Dr. Mohammed is asking the test still positive result, uh, even when we used ACT can clear that. I don't quite get the question. Dr. Mohammed, if you can explain. And a test, let me, let me try to understand it. The question is, uh, the, may, may, may a test be still positive after giving ACT treatment? Is, yes, probably, yeah. Is this the correct? Uh, I think this is what he means. Yeah, and I think if we go back to this one, if the test was using HRP2, because uh, the antigen may stay in the blood for even four or five weeks uh, and um, the test may be positive even if the parasite is completely cleared there is no is dead and removed from the circulation hrp2 test may still be positive i hope this responds to the question Very interesting presentation and uh, because it's a big problem and it's a problem which is emerging more and more. Um, this protein, the histidine rich protein, is a protein which has a lot of repeat sequences. So, and um, these are redundant in uh, the protein. So it becomes a very good target for monoclonals. As I said, you can find it in the cytoplasma of the red blood cells infected by plasmodium falciparum, but also on the membrane of the red blood cells. And it's also secreted in big amounts in the plasma. And um, we don't know exactly what is the function, but we know it's not a vital function. So parasite is very happy. It can survive uh, without uh, this uh, protein. This antigen is located in one of the chromosomes of falciparum, chromosome seven, and the parasite uh, falciparum has uh, 14 chromosomes. Uh, we have a 23 double chromosome. The parasite, they have uh, 14. So they are not so distant from, from humans in terms of uh, genetic uh, uh, capacity. Now, um, it's important uh, these uh, deletions because uh, they basically make uh, an HRP2-based test no longer working. And uh, we know that uh, these are two thirds of the RDTs currently bought by the malaria program all over the world, especially in Africa, because again, falciparum is the dominant uh, parasite. And if we think about other options to detect falciparum, maybe based on um, PF, PLDH, or even pan PLDH, these are really not widely available. So if, if a program needs to suddenly move to another alternative RDT, non-detecting HRP2, there are major issues around supply and also about performance because the PF, PLDH RDTs are, have lower sensitivity and they are much less stable when you're exposed to high temperature. So they tend to degrade easily. Now, these uh, monoclonals, uh, which are on the RDTs, uh, they are also uh, reacting on HRP3 antigens, which, so there is some cross reactivity. And this HRP3 is a different uh, protein produced by a different gene, which is situated in a different part of the uh, chromosomes on chromosome 13. And uh, if uh, the plasmodium falciparum loses completely HRP2, but still has some HRP3, the RDT may still work. 
So look at what is happening in the RBT product testing. Remember, this is a system in the lab which WHO uses to uh, analyze performance of the RBTs. If we um, use some parasites, uh, we have both HRP2 and HRP3. The, all of the RDTs are able to detect them very well. So HRP2 detecting RDTs work very well if the parasite have both HRP2 and HRP3 antigens. Now, what happens if the parasite has, um, is missing HRP2 but still has uh, HRP3. Now, some RDTs are detecting very badly, but some of them are still detecting quite well. And if the parasite is missing both HRP2 and HRP3, then the detection is very bad. HRP2 detecting RDTs are not working at all. So why this? Let me, it depends really on the parasite density. If uh, a parasite is HRP2 negative and HRP3 positive, and the parasite density is more than a thousand parasites per microliter, there could be, uh, in a high proportion of cases, uh, the test may still uh, recognize the um, HRP3, which is cross-reacting, and give a positive result. But uh, if the parasite density is low, only a very small proportion of RDTs can give us a positive result, and most of them will give us a negative result. So this explains why it's important sometimes to detect the prevalence of HRP2 deletions, but also HRP3 deletions in the samples. Now, the big problem was first detected in South America, there were uh, big problems in uh, Peru initially, and then started to become in the Amazon uh, basin, in Bolivia, Colombia, Guyana, Brazil, uh, Suriname, Honduras, all of the surrounding areas. And uh, since then, 2020, 2010, there has been several uh, publications also showing problems in Asia, problems in India, problems in Africa. And for your countries, the big concern it was the area in Eritrea, where starting in 2014, some clinicians were noting that the patients coming to the hospitals had a microscopy positive, but an RDT negative result. And unfortunately, they were sending some of the pharmacovigilance reporting forms, the yellow forms, in the system to flag there is a problem with the RDTs, but nobody was listening. There was a, a woman uh, around 48 hours, unfortunately, she was negative on RDT. She was sent back home. She came back after two weeks still with fever. Uh, again, RDT was done negative, sent back home. She became very, very seriously ill. She was admitted to the hospital. The RDT was negative. The microscopy was full of parasites. It was falciparum, and she passed away. So very, very terrible situation. As a result, then the program, in collaboration with WHO, had a series of samples done in multiple facilities. And in some, these were the findings. They were using some different types of RDTs that you can see uh, of different nature. All of them have a HRP2 test line. This is in this one is here, the T1. In another type of test produced by another company, it is the T1 line, HRP2, also negative. These were done on the same patient. And the third test was even done, uh, which was a pan PLDH on the T line, you see it's positive. Now, very interesting, this type of test have also a T2 line, which is a PF PLDH line. And this was uh, positive. So HRP2 line negative, PF PLDH line positive. And also this test have a PF PV 
PLDH, and this was negative. So it was a positive falciparum not recognized by the HRP2 monoclonals, but detected by the PFPLDH specific monoclonals. Now, this uh, other test uh, have a one line, which is HRP2, nothing can be seen, but on the PAN-PLDH line, there is a very thin, very, very, very thin line, which shows uh, positivity. And the PAN-PLDH on another test also shows a more clear positive line. So this is one way of uh, assessing the presence of a falciparum infection with HRP2 deletions. Then uh, in uh, these uh, different sites, you saw there were many dots where they did the survey, they detected two facilities where the prevalence of um, uh, deletions in the HRP2 uh, genes were even 80%, in another place was almost 42%. And when they were looking then into this um, RDT negative uh, uh, samples, maybe they were thinking could be uh, a low parasite density. So in this uh, Ginde, for instance, they looked at parasite density of all these infections and uh, there were few, certainly very low, but many of them also have very high parasite density. So big uh, issue that um, even at higher parasite density, the RDT is not able to give uh, uh, positivity. Now, WHO has been compiling all this evidence uh, and uh, we see some uh, colleagues doing gardening. Maybe we can close the video. That's better. Toca <laughs> car. We, uh, this uh, website available on WHO GMP um, web page can, uh, um, if you go into, uh, it's one of the application, it looks into the gene deletions and it may show with some circles, which are proportional to size, the number of studies which have been done in different countries. If you click and zoom more, you can also see the number of surveys which have been clearly done. And in red, it will show if there is a positive uh, uh, finding in terms of HRP2 deletions and gray if it was not detected in the survey. And then if you click and zoom more and you click maybe on this dot here, it will have, you will have a pop-up, a window, which will tell you how many samples were tested, what was the percentage of deletions, what was the year of the survey, and it gives you the specific reference for the publication from which these data were extracted. So very good way of trying to get the information available for each one. Now, what can be uh, the reason for a false negative results. Now, we, we are focusing on the last uh, reason, which is uh, HRP2 deletion. For some reason, the parasite has lost uh, as a mutation, which makes then not expressing uh, one of the antigen in the blood. But there are many other reasons that needs to be also looked at. One, it could be um, an error in the performance of the test. We saw, for instance, if it doesn't put the right amount of buffer solution or the amount of blood, this could result in a false negative result. Or if we use a comparator, another test which is actually gives wrong results. For instance, a microscopist who reads many, many negative uh, results as positive, we may have that the RDT has done its job correctly, but the microscopist is giving false positive result. Also, there could be a problem in the RDT itself. For instance, the, there could be a quality, a problem in manufacturing, and this may give uh, from the source uh, an RDT which gives a false negative. 
or when we say high exposures to temperature during transport and storage or even freezing, this may destroy the, the monoclonals uh, which are on the test. Also, if the parasite density is very, very low, maybe below 50 parasites per microliter, the test may be well, it has been really designed and is built to detect 200 parasites and above, but if the parasite team is very low, it may actually miss. And there is one rare, rare situation when even hyperparasitemia may give um, negative results when there is also high antibodies uh, in the blood of the subject. And this calls what we call it prozone effect. Uh, so there are many antigen antibodies reaction which will then interfere with the correct uh, running of the, um, of the immune, uh, um, let's say, uh, reactions which is needed to have a good functioning RDT. So these are all many reasons why a test may be false negative. So how can a clinician then decide it's a gene deletion? This is interesting. So in an individual patient, this is how a suspicion of HRP2 deletion is uh, defined. If there is a negative result on the HRP2 test line, on at least two different RDTs, uh, which we know about good quality. And at the same time, from the same patient, we do another RDT and there is a pan PLDH or a PF PLDH test line, which is positive. Or we can have a two RDT which are negative and the sample is confirmed by microscopy by with falciparum by two qualified microscopists. And we, we require two because again, this problem of sometimes uh, false positive results are given by one microscopist. Also, um, if uh, there is a negative HRP2 test result uh, and the patient has re been recently traveling to an area where there is a high prevalence of HRP2 deletions like in Eritrea or Peru, that may also prompt in the clinician some suspicion that could be an HRP2 deletion. Okay, so what about the program? How can a malaria program, from receiving multiple results, then suspect that there is a problem of HRP2 deletion? And one way is Sometimes uh, surveys, uh, like the malaria indicator surveys, are done with both microscopy and RDTs. And when there is a big discordance between the results of RDTs and microscopies, and they show that there is like 10-15% more positive with microscopy than RDTs, then there is a problem. Because uh, on average, we should expect a little more, a little higher positivity with RDTs compared to microscopy. Also, and this is the case in Eritrea, but also Djibouti when we were there together with Dr. Zamani, when we hear multiple health workers making complaints that there is, uh, RDTs are not working while the microscopy give positive results, that is also, an, um, a, should give concern to the malaria program. And, um, this, uh, once this have been confirmed uh, by doing uh, systematically RDT and microscopy together, then one needs to do a proper survey. So it needs a very good investigation once these issues are being ruled out. Now, uh, it was interesting for us to give some data, even it probably still preliminary for what we know so far from Sudan and Somalia and uh, Djibouti. Uh, Yemen, uh, we don't have recent surveys, but uh, for Sudan, uh, because of the proximity with Eritrea, then there was uh, already a big uh, need to do quickly a survey. And this was done in the big, into these states uh, bordering Eritrea. 
And luckily, so far, there has been very low rate of discordant results in uh, among uh, the people which are HRP2 uh, positive. So, so far from the survey done in the two states bordering Eritrea, the, there has been no uh, reports of HRP2 deletions, but because the distribution can be very heterogeneous, it's important now to repeat the surveys in other parts of the country. Now in Djibouti, there has been only a rapid assessment so far. There were dry blood spots taken from suspected patients. And these were tested in CDC Atlanta lab. And there were very many um, samples that were HRP2 negative and PLDH positive. And uh, ongoing, there is at the moment some work with PCR to confirm where are the deletions, if it is uh, the HRP2 or HRP3 gene. And uh, this is work in progress. In Somalia, uh, there has been also some reports uh, of um, patients which were HRP2 negative and PAN-PLDH positive or and uh, having PF on microscopy. And uh, so far, uh, the analysis has been only on uh, 20 samples which shows a double deletion, HRP2, HRP3 in 14 out of 20. And in 17 out of 20, these were HRP2 gene deletions. So the, the problem is there and needs to be seriously looked at. Now Yemen, sorry, this is super, super small, but there was a survey uh, done in 2014 in part of the country, this is a publication available, and it shows less than 4% HRP2 deletions, no HRP3 deletion, no double deletions. So, but clearly, because again, proximity to Eritrea, Djibouti, uh, we should definitely be cautious and alert on the possibility in Yemen as well. Now, just uh, what is the different step? Number one, if there are reports of false negative, it, this should be investigated. A team needs to go to the site and exclude some of the basic uh, issues around like errors by the uh, clinician, nurse, lab technician, look at the parasite density with good microscopy, look at how the RDTs were stored, uh, if there is, if it is really some doubts, one can take some test and send them for load testing. Okay, and uh, if there is, after ruling out all this, there is still some suspicion of a parasite uh, gene deletions, then one has to systematically take for the same patients uh, multiple RDTs both the detecting HRP2 and a PAN-PLDH or HRP2 and a PF-PLDH and good microscopy at the same time and compare the result. And if there is a clear discordance which much more positive on microscopy and the slides have been kept, have been validated, have been checked, then this is now the moment to do a proper survey. And um, when it is the time, then this needs to go into a proper protocol. There is a, a, an approach which has been uh, defined. It's a big survey. It requires uh, good training before starting. It requires uh, a good collaboration with labs, which needs to do also the genetic analysis of the HRP2 deletions. And uh, it requires clearly also funding. And this is very good that many countries have put these surveys, which are very demanding, into global fund applications. So this is the approach if one really has already suspicions like we have, unfortunately, in Djibouti, and I would say also in Somalia at the moment. Probably in Yemen, we are not yet uh, uh, there, maybe need to have more uh, um, reports uh, or careful analysis from some places where there could be discordant results. 
So what, what next? After we confirmed that, that there is a, a, a problem, the current recommendation is that if uh, more than, if uh, HRP2 deletions are found in more than 5% of falciparum cases coming to, health falcip uh, to the health facilities, then the program needs to change the RDTs. They need to replace HRP2 detecting RDTs with other RDTs at the moment, either post they can detect PAN-PLDH or they are specific for PF-PLDH. And why 5%? Because there is like a balance uh, between um, some uh, uh, loss of uh, positivity because of gene deletions that we may accept because if we move too quickly to the PAN-PLDH or the PF-PLDH detecting additives, they may have low sensitivity at low parasitemia. So they are not as good as the HRP2 detecting additives. So when we get 5% is clearly now the time to change RBTs. And so far, unfortunately, because it's not a vital protein, once this mutation have been found, they don't go back. They tend to be stable in the parasite population. Now, uh, the alternatives, as I said, we have a, a PAN-PLDH test, which can be for the moment selected. But uh, big problem, this is produced by Access Bio and this manufacturer at the moment as a receives by uh, a notice of concern, which is a flagging of quality problems in the production. So they need to address this quality to be back into the procurement of the Global Fund. And uh, the Global Fund at the moment has listed on a special list, they give uh, temporary approval to buy some PF, PLDH detecting RDTs, which are produced by an Indian company called Rapigen. And this is the one that the, the countries can uh, procure with Global Fund money and use uh, to replace uh, defective uh, RDTs, which are only targeting HRP2 if there are highly prevalent uh, HRP2 deletions. Why don't we have more of this other test? It's clearly because uh, the HRP2 have very high sensitivity and they can even um, stay stable up to 40, 45 degrees. So the, for using the peripheral areas, they are very good. And second, because they are so cheap, uh, manufacturers don't invest very much into uh, innovation and producing more, uh, let's say, a different type of RBTs. These are very popular, and so are the manufacturers are not, they don't have really any, uh, let's say, motivation to invest in different type of RBTs. This is the last slide, just to conclude. We don't yet know the full extent of the, the prevalence of HRP2 deletions. And we know that by sure, alternatives are limited and they are less uh, um, uh, capable in terms of sensitivity and thermostability compared to HRP2 detecting RDTs. What we know at the moment is very sketchy and spotty. So we, even if we know for some countries, it could be only few selected sites. And when the decision is taken to replace the RDTs, uh, one has to be also uh, aware that by taking these alternative RDTs, some, um, some falciparum cases will be anyway missed because PFPLDH or PANPLDH RDTs are less sensitive. And also when this is communicated and the change is made, it needs to be well managed with good communication because it may erode the confidence on RDTs, which has been at the moment the, the technology which has allowed confirmation of malaria diagnosis in many places where there is no um, microscopy.